Senator Richard Blumenthal and Republican challenger Leora Levy here to the WFSB studios for their only debate this year. We're of course looking very forward to hearing their thoughts on a number of very important topics, but we want to start right now by introducing the panelists who will be asking the questions tonight. We have Susan Raff, our chief political reporter right here at WFSB. Julia Bergman is the state politics reporter with CT Insider, our partner in tonight's debate. Susan Haig is the political writer and state house reporter with the Associated Press. And Ebong Udoma, senior political reporter with WSHU Political Public Radio. Now we did a coin toss with the campaigns yesterday and determined that Senator Blumenthal will give the first opening statement. Mrs. Levy will answer our first question and she will make the final closing statement. And here's how the questioning will go throughout the show tonight. We have given each candidate 90 seconds to make an opening statement. Then they'll be asked a question and we'll have two minutes to respond. After that, the opposing candidate will have one minute for a rebuttal. Now, as the moderator, I have the ability here to grant another 30 seconds to the original person who was questioned if it's determined a response is warranted. But after that, we will move on to the next question. It is important to note tonight the campaigns agreed to this format and these rules when they committed to the debate. So let's get started. Senator Blumenthal, you begin tonight with 90 seconds to make your opening statement. Thank you very much, and thank you to our hosts. I am really honored to be here tonight with the stakes so high in this election. As your Attorney General, now as your United States Senator, I have stood up to special interests and fought for you. Now, as the stakes are higher and families confront higher costs and price gouging, reproductive rights, and even our democracy are on the line, I want to continue working for you, lowering costs, cutting taxes, protecting Social Security, and restoring reproductive freedoms. My opponent sees things very differently. She supports Donald Trump. She celebrated the overturning of Roe v. Wade. She wants more tax breaks for the wealthy, not the middle class, as I have advocated. And she has pledged to be a reliable 51st Republican vote to put Mitch McConnell in charge of the United States Senate. She told Donald Trump that she would always have his back. I'll always have yours. I'd be honored to have your vote. Senator Blumenthal, thank you very much. Mrs. Levy, you also have 90 seconds now as well. Well, I would also like to thank you for having this, hosting this debate tonight. I'd like to thank the viewers for taking their time to watch this very important discussion. You know, you will hear two very different views of America and of Connecticut tonight. My opponent is a 37-year career politician. He is out of touch with what real life is like here in Connecticut. I've never been so worried about our country. That's why I'm running to be your U.S. Senator. We have inflation causing high prices for everything. Food prices are up 18 percent. Gas prices are much higher than they were on the day that President Biden took office. Um, we have an invasion at our border. It is not immigration. It is an invasion. Our children are, are not receiving the first-rate education they deserve. They've had learning loss. They've had developmental uh, s slowdowns because of the lockdowns of, of the Democrats in control of Connecticut. Parents' rights are being infringed. We can change everything. But in order to change, we must change the leadership. And I ask for your, le for your vote on November 8th. Mrs. Levy, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Our first question tonight, and again, you get two minutes to answer, is from, from Susan Raff, and it's on inflation. Susan. Good evening. When you talk to most people today, they will tell you that the economy and inflation are very troubling, and that's their number one issue. And in fact, uh, a Quinnipiac poll out today shows an increasing number of people are very concerned about the economy and feel it's an urgent issue. If you are elected, what would be the three specific things that you would do to make things better and ease the pain for people here in Connecticut? 
Well, you know, as I've traveled the state, I have heard so many stories of the problems caused by inflation. This inflation was deliberately inflicted on us by the Biden policies voted for by my opponent. The trillions of dollars of spending, which Larry Summers, a Democrat economist, warned would cause record high inflation, and that's what we're facing. First thing I would do is to stop the spending. A Republican majority will not fund the 87,000 IRS agents that that my opponent voted for in the Biden Blumenthal Build Infla Inflation Back Better Act. By the way, it will not reduce inflation and it will not affect climate change. I will not, we will not fund the slush fund for the Energy Department nor the bank in the EPA. We also must reignite American energy production. That was a, this is an intentional energy shortage which has contributed to the, the inflation all of us are feeling. We have to make choices. Do we fill our gas tank? Do we feed our children? How are we going to pay for home heating oil if we can get it? There's a shortage of that too. This is an intentional attack on American energy production which is at the, at the core of, of, our, our infl of the inflation we are experiencing. And American, America has the largest production uh, reserves of energy in the world, and we produce it more cleanly than anyone else. So by, by killing our production on day one in office, canceling Keystone Pipeline, canceling leases, ending exploration on U.S. lands and public waters, we have really crushed our energy um, industry. We have created this shortage, and everybody is paying the price. Mrs. Levy, thank you very much. Thank you. Senator, you have one minute to respond. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Susan, for that really critical question. Uh, I know from my visits around the state how crushing the higher cost of living has been for so many families. We have some good news today. The federal government, as a result of our urging, is providing $86.4 million in LIHEAP funding to get more families through the winter. But we need to do much more to lower gasoline prices as well as provide more home heating oil. Uh, I pushed President Biden to release more strategic petroleum reserve. He did it. Prices came down. My opponent opposed it. I think we need to cut taxes, middle class taxes, through a renewal of the child tax credit. My opponent opposed it. We need to take additional action on the energy front. Keystone is a distraction. It never would have delivered any product. It was simply to export it Senator, abroad. Thank you very much, Senator. We appreciate that. Your one minute is up right there. People on, on my position. All right, we'll give you 30 more seconds. Uh, I have never address, addressed the child tax credit, and I've never opposed it, so, and I wouldn't oppose it. But I find it odd that, that my opponent in the, uh, this Biden Blumenthal Build Inflation Back Better bill actually raised taxes on middle class Americans, on small businesses and job creators, on seniors on a fixed income, on their 401ks. You know, he talks about this, but these things that he's talking about are all election year gimmicks. I do have to wrap you right there. And especially this releasing the oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is Thank reckless Thank you very much, foolish. Mrs. Levy. We appreciate it. We do want to move on to our second question right now for Senator Blumenthal from Julia Bergman. It is on the U.S. economy. Julia. Senator Blumenthal, given the Federal Reserve's decision today to once again hike interest rates to combat inflation and that Democrats have controlled both the White House and both chambers of Congress for two years now, what grade would you give the U.S. economy today and how would you get it to an A? I'm really interested, Julia, in what action we should take. And let me give you a few to stop inflation, which is, in fact, a major issue today. In addition to bringing down energy prices. I think these crushing costs on families need to be reduced by a windfall profits penalty on oil and gas companies. They are making record profits, two to four times what they did last year. They're set to make $4 trillion this year 
if we put some of that money back in consumer pockets, it will help address inflation. Cut the federal gas tax on energy products, on gasoline. And in addition, provide more of the kind of strategic petroleum reserve that is necessary. Those tax cuts, the child tax credit, would be in effect today if Republicans had agreed to renew them. And so I call on Republicans when we go back to extend and renew those tax credit. My opponent has supported the tra Trump tax cuts. 83% of those tax cuts benefits, 83% went to the pockets of wealthy and big corporations. I want to see more benefits to our middle class and Americans. And I believe that there is vast opportunity to do more to help American families and our middle class if we take stronger action against inflation as we can do readily when the Congress comes back, if Republicans cooperate and if we are in control. If Mitch McConnell takes over, the Republicans are talking about slashing Social Security, slashing Medicare. These kinds of actions will only Senator, increase thank costs you. for Americans. Thank you Senator, very much. I just want to follow up um, real quick. You just detailed how you wanted to improve um, the economy. Can we get you to say what grade you would give the U.S. economy today? I think the grade is literally ongoing. I don't think that we can give it a grade midstream, but I do think measures like the Chips and Science Act, which brings back the supply chain, lowers cost. I would give the the economy a chance to achieve an A, which I think it can do. Mrs. Levy, you have one minute to respond. Yes. Well, this is really interesting. More election year gimmicks. And when it comes to Social Security and Medicare, I don't know any Republican who wants to cut those programs. Again, just as our as my opponent misled the American people on whether or not he served in Vietnam. He said he did and he didn't. Whether he attends the Communist Party, he said he didn't and he did. Once again, I'm not sure how we can believe much of what he said, because frankly, he raised taxes on the middle class with the Biden Blumenthal Build Inflation Back Better Act, with the American Relief Plan. That was another one, that was a $1.9 million spending that started this inflation. And you were warned by Larry Summers and other Democrat economists that this would be the result. You did it anyway. I would grade the economy an F. Okay, Mrs. Levy, thank you very much. The next question is actually for you as Can well. Can I respond? It, would May you I like respond? 30 additional seconds? Sure. Thank you. Uh, let's be very clear. Pandemic relief kept alive many of our businesses. The Paycheck Protection Program, the Restaurant Revitalization Program, the Shuttered Venues Operator Grant Program, many of them bipartisan. At a time of need, the government came to the rescue of our small businesses. And I'm proud that we stepped up and we did it in a bipartisan way, not a tax increase, investment in the future of America. Senator, thank you very much. Our next question, he had we're going to move on. He seconds extra to begin with when he wouldn't give the grade initially. And now he had 30 seconds more. So he's had an extra minute, actually. Well, the next question is actually for you as well. But if you'd like to respond briefly for that, for sure, I will allow that. I would, because also, you know, another election year gimmick that he's talked about is this windfall uh, profits tax he wants to put on the and on the oil companies. You know these oil they're making profits because the price is so high and the price is so high because your party, your President Biden, and with your support, has shut down energy production, has created a shortage, and it's simple supply and demand. Economics 101, when the, de when the supply falls and the demand remains the same, the price goes up. Mrs. Levy, thank That's you. That's what happens. We need to reignite thank American you very much, Mrs. energy Levy. production. We're going to move on to question number three right now. This is from Ebong Udoma. It is uh, for Mrs. Levy on energy costs and supply. Hello, Mrs. Levy. Hello. Um, we'd like to drill down on this energy thing because um, <clears throat> a lot of people are concerned about the high cost of energy, especially in the winter. 
What specifically would you do to change federal energy policy that would make things better? Specifically, what would you propose as a Republican? I would encourage additional drilling on U.S. lands and, and waters. I would, I would re, renew the leases that have been canceled. I, I would encourage more American energy production rather than begging our adversaries and bad actors in the world like Venezuela, like, like Iran, like the Saudis and OPEC. The reason that we have to beg them for production is that we've shut down our own. And as I said, America has the largest reserve in the world and we produce it more cleanly than anyone else. Why wouldn't you want good American jobs and clean American energy instead of, alter of, of things of oil from other countries that produce it in a very dirty and environmentally dirty, unsafe way? Talking about dirty, what would you do considering that we're concerned about climate change? Well, again, America produces energy more cleanly than anybody else, than any other country. So right now, we, we, are, work, we are developing alternatives, and that is great. I'm, a hundred, I'm for alternatives, but they are not ready to take over for fossil fuels co uh, completely. So as long as our, our economy still depends on fossil fuels, I want it produced in America. You know. One thing I've learned is that between 2005 and 2017, the United States actually reduced its carbon emissions more than what would have been required by the Paris uh, Climate Treaty. We exceeded the goals, while our adversaries like China continue to pollute and, and were not limited to what they could do. So. We want American energy production. It will help our economy tremendously. It will make life much easier Mrs. for Levy, Connecticut thank you. families. Thank you very much. Senator, you have one minute now to respond. Thank you. Uh, Americans are rightly angry at the big oil companies because they are profiteering. And that's why I proposed a windfall profits penalty that will put rebates back in their pockets quarterly. That's why I proposed at cut in the fuel tax. The energy companies, those big oil companies, have more leases now, 3,600, than they did at the time that Trump was president, 2,500. But they're not using them all. They are profiteering. And in fact, we, in the latest measure that we passed, the Inflation Reduction Act, actually increased their ability to drill off the coast of Alaska and the Gulf of Mexico. In the long run, let me emphasize, we need renewables. We need solar, wind, which again, the inflation reduction package provides investment in rebates, tax credits, which also lower, absolutely lower, the cost Senator, of energy and fuel. Senator, thank you very much. We want to move on to question number four right now. This is from Susan Haig. It is for you, Senator Blumenthal, and it is on Social Security. Good evening, Senator. Good evening. Uh, it's now predicted that the uh, Social Security Trust Fund will be unable to pay full benefits beginning 2035. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Medicare's Trust Fund for inpatient hospital care is projected to be depleted by 2028. Considering tens of millions of Americans depend on these programs, what do you think needs to be done to shore them up financially for the long term so people who are paying into those benefits now, paying into those programs now, they're assured that they will receive the full benefits they're expecting? That is such a central and important question. First, let's be clear. Americans earn Social Security. It's not a federal spending program. It's an insurance program. And they deserve to be secure and know it's going to be there for them. My opponent just said that nobody in the Congress wants to cut the benefits. Well, her main supporter in the United States Senate, Rick Scott, actually has proposed sunsetting it after five years. Others say one year. The House leadership is about to hold it hostage as the price of shutting down the government. That's where the Republicans will go if they take over. My proposal, it's called Social Security 2100, a companion to Congressman John Larson's in the House would actually shore it up, 
make sure that it will be solvent going way past 2035 so Americans can count on it as they should an insurance program and it will increase the cost of living adjustment COLA as it's called we just had an 8.7 percent increase but there's nothing in the law that guarantees seniors that they can keep pace with the actual cost of living to them those kinds of reforms are necessary to give Americans what they have earned and my opponents main supporters are ready to adopt all kinds of proposals my opponent has said all options should be considered well I'll tell you one option I won't consider cutting benefits for Social Security that is off the table it should be for every candidate and every member of the United States Congress we need to stand up and speak out and fight as I will do for a Social Security that is secure for all Americans now going into the future. Senator, thank you very much. <laughs> Mrs. Levy, you have one minute. Yes, well, you know, my parents are 90 and 91, and they depend on Social Security. We wouldn't be in this problem if my opponent and his colleagues in the Democrat Party hadn't raided Social Security and Medicare for their other socialist big government programs. We wouldn't even be here. And yes, it is our money because we worked for it and it, we, it is taken from our paychecks without our ab ability to, to say yes or no. So reg regarding the COLA of 8.7%, the reason it was so high is because inflation is 8.2%. It's the highest COLA cost of living adjustment that we have seen because of this terrible economy. It would be better if seniors on fixed income ha could afford to live if the economy was in better condition if their 401ks weren't so depleted Mrs. after Levy, what you. what has happened this in the last two years thank you very much we appreciate it uh, if i can respond so uh, 30 seconds senator i i note unfortunately that my opponent now has not in fact taken off the table cuts or benefits all options not so for me. Cutting benefits is not an option. And her supporters in the Republican Party in the United States Senate have said sunset it after a year or five years. That is unacceptable to me. And she will be, as she has said herself, a reliable Senator, thank you. 51st vote may, in the United States Senate. Well, we want to move. Well, you actually my have, position. You actually have the next question coming up, and I want to get right to that. There's a lot okay. to talk about tonight. Um, Mrs. Levy, this is for you from Julia Bergman, and it involves uh, the recent ruling from the Supreme Court regarding Roe v. Wade. Mrs. Levy, the overturning of Roe v. Wade by the U.S. Supreme Court has uh, spurred concern that other landmark rulings could be next, including those guaranteeing the right to same-sex marriage and access to birth control. Do you think Congress should pass legislation ensuring federal protections for same-sex marriage and access to contraception? Why or why not? So, um, first of all, I, I don't see that one necessarily follows the other. I know that, that Justice Thomas referred to it, but that's not where I stand. I, I, I don't see that, that, that those two issues have anything to do with the Roe v. Wade decision, uh, the Dobbs decision reversing Roe v. Wade. It sent it back to the state where it belongs. And in the state of Connecticut, Abortion is legal. It is codified in this Constitution of Connecticut. And that's, so nobody in Connecticut has lost any of their rights. I am personally pro-life, with the exceptions of rape, incest, and life of the mother. But that's my personal view. I, I agree that it is a state's right issue. You know, my, I'd like to go back to, to what my opponent said about my views on Social Security and about Rick Scott. I was with Rick Scott last night, and he also said he does not intend, he does not support cutting Social Security. He said it outright to a room full of people. So, you know, again, he's mischaracterizing our positions, and I think it's important for people to know that. He mischaracterizes a lot, it seems. So, you know, again, um, the problems that people are talking to me about as I travel the state, 
or the fact they can't afford their lives, they can't afford to feed their children. I met a welder in, at the Durham Fair. He said to me, I have a good job. I've always provided for my family, but I don't know how I'm going to pay my mortgage. Every month I have to decide which bills I pay and which bills I let slide and hope they don't come after me. Well, I'm going to Washington to help him make sure he can afford a good life. He's not asking for an extravagant life. He wants to afford Mrs. a good Levy, life for his family. Thank you very much. I thank do want you. to go to the one-minute response from the senator as well. Um, on this really important issue, to me, the critical question is, who decides? I trust women to make decisions about their own health care. My opponent wants to give those decisions to government officials or politicians. I hear her making these assurances about respect for state law, but I sat on the United States Senate Judiciary Committee and I heard three Republican justice nominees say they would respect Roe v. Wade as precedent. And then at the first opportunity, they ripped it apart. So forgive me, but I'm not buying it. The fact is my opponent celebrated the end of Roe v. Wade to say that it's unconnected to a possible ban on contraception or any other violation of rights of privacy is simply disingenuous. That's why Clarence Thomas raised them. Senator, they all thank depend you on the very right much, Mrs. Privacy. Levy. Yes. We ask you both to sit tight for just a moment because we do want to take a quick commercial break and our Senate debate from Channel 3 will continue right after this.
Live from the studios of WFSB, Channel 3 Eyewitness News, and CT Insider present the U.S. Senate Debate. Welcome back tonight to our primetime debate between Senator Richard Blumenthal and Leora Levy. Of course, we have several more issues to talk about tonight, and we do want to get right to our next question, which is for you, Senator Blumenthal, from Susan Raff, and it is about the war in Ukraine. I'm sorry, could you that? It is for the senator, and the issue is on the war in Ukraine. You're welcome. Senator Blumenthal, I'd like to focus on the war in Ukraine, which is about freedom and is having a huge impact all over the world. And as a member of the Armed Services Committee and someone who went to Ukraine, how far should the United States go to offer its support? I believe some of the numbers I was able to pull up, uh, we've already given about $188 million, $40 billion has been authorized. Should Ukraine have a blank check? We have a national security stake in the freedom-fighting Ukrainian warriors who are so stalwartly and impressively defending their country against a brutal, genocidal war criminal, Vladimir Putin. In my trip to Ukraine, I visited the mass graves surrounding Kyiv at Bucha and heard stories about women and children dying with their hands tied behind their backs. If we don't stop Putin in Ukraine, he will continue against other NATO countries. So apart from the moral obligation, we also have a national security obligation. I will work for another supplemental package, along with my colleague Senator Graham and other Republicans. It will be bipartisan before the end of the year. I hope it will be in the tens of billions of dollars because we are at a critical phase in this war. Ukraine needs more of the HIMARS, multiple launch, long range artillery. It needs more air defense against the rain of terror from the skies that Putin has inflicted on Ukraine, killing in innocent civilians. And we should be providing even stronger sanctions. Senator Graham and I have proposed that Russia be designated a state sponsor of terrorism, which would trigger such additional sanctions. And humanitarian assistance should be provided. So I think our military leaders, and I've talked to them about the Ukrainian fight, are very hopeful that the counteroffensive now underway will make progress in the coming months, despite the winter, and that we will see Ukraine push back the Russians with our help because they are a demoralized and debilitated force. Now is the critical time. Senator, thank you very much. Mrs. Levy, you have one minute. Well, let's look, let's remember how we got here. We have a vacuum, an absence of American leadership. One of the first things President Biden did was to stop the arms shipments committed to Ukraine by the pro previous administration. Then he oversaw and ordered the disastrous Afghanistan withdrawal where we evacuated, abandoned our state-of-the-art Air Force Base Bagram, abandoned American citizens and allies. The world was watching, especially Putin and Xi in China. Then he, allowed, he watched while thousands of Russian troops gathered on the borders of Ukraine and said something off the cuff like a minor incursion would be all right. My opponent didn't say anything about that then. He had no concern. Then now, apparently, tactical nuclear weapons are okay, and we're even have running public service announcements in New York about what to do. Mrs. Levy, so, thank you very much. Peace through thank strength. You. Building our we military want to move on to our next solution. question right now, which is actually for you, Mrs. Levy. Okay. It is from Susan Haig, and the topic is on the political divide here in our country. On what? The political divide here in our country. Thank you. Good evening, Mrs. Levy. It's fair to say there is a real political divide that's happening in this country right now. Recent polling has found that seven in ten Americans believe this country's political system is endangered. However, they seem to disagree on who and what is to blame. Do you believe our democracy is at risk? And if so, what needs to be done before it's too late? Well, one thing that disturbs me terribly is that we seem to have lost the ability to disagree 
without being disagreeable. You know, we can disagree on policy, but we are Americans, and the violence we have seen lately um, on both sides of the spectrum, both from both sides, whether it's Senator Schumer calling on, saying to the uh, Supreme Court justices that they have reaped the whirlwind and they don't know what will hit them, and then an assassin goes to, to the home of one of our Supreme Court justices, or whether it's the attack we saw last week, terrible attack on Paul Pelosi by someone who's obviously deranged and has mental illness problems, but yet he felt he could do that out of politics. We have to learn to live together, to agree to disagree. You know, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill used to, to really disagree vehemently, but at the end of the day, they would have a beer together. And, you know, Senator and I, we live in the same town. Our kids went to the same school. We, we have been in the same rooms together, but, you know, we should be able to disagree on policy without being disagreeable to each other. And when I get to the Senate, I look forward to working with senators on both sides of the aisle because, you know, he tries to characterize me in one way, but he can't because I'm not a politician. He's a 37-year career politician, so he's used to that. He's actually part of the problem. I'm going to Washington because I'm a different kind of person. I'm going to Washington because I've never been so worried about our country. And it's time that we get it back on track and be able to talk to each other again Mrs. in a Levy, civil, respectful you. way. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Senator, you have one minute. Yes, thank you. Nothing worries me more than the rise of violent extremism in this country. And I am deeply concerned about our divisions. I have sought to bring the country together, at least my colleagues and I, in measures like protecting kids on the internet, bipartisan, aid for veterans who are exposed to burn pits and toxic chemicals, bipartisan, other measures that have been bipartisan, like stopping human trafficking, bipartisan, signed by President Trump. Every day, I work on measures that are bipartisan, like the infrastructure program that my opponent says is wasteful spending and launches a partisan attack against. My opponent has called the January 6th attack on the Capitol legitimate political discourse. Legitimate political discourse. She sided with the attackers, not with the police. Senator, and let me tell you, thank you that Senator, does very not much. encourage thank the country you, coming together. I appreciate your time right there. Our next question is for you, Senator Blumenthal. It is from Ebong, and it is on the uh, issue with police officers across the country, as well as here in Connecticut. Uh, Senator Blumenthal, for many Connecticut, uh, Connecticut police departments, recruiting and retaining officers has become difficult as the applicant pool has shrunk and young cops are going to other agencies, our major cities. Bridgeport, for example, is short 128 officers. Uh, democratic society runs under law and order. Police are concerned about so many weapons and uh, assault weapons, ghost guns out there. What can we do to turn this around? Ibang, I met recently with police chiefs from across the state of Connecticut, and I'm deeply concerned about recruitment. You know, people are rightly concerned about the safety in their communities, I hear it from them, and we should be supporting our police, giving them the kind of respect they deserve. I served as the state's chief federal prosecutor for four and a half years, and then as attorney general for 20 years. I work closely with them, and I have brought back to the state of Connecticut $45 million for funding, training, as well as equipment, and more police. I supported a bipartisan measure to provide and fund 100,000 police across the country. I supported a bipartisan measure to penalize any city or town that defunded the police. I think we should be providing more funding. We have to hold the police accountable, but we also must give them the support that they need and deserve. And I know from 
my experience prosecuting, that police want accountability for the small numbers. It's a fraction, a tiny, minuscule number, like the ones in Minnesota who killed George Floyd, to hold them accountable. But we need to support our police, and that is why I have taken action in the Congress as chairman of the Subcommittee on the Constitution to achieve more gun violence prevention because very often the police themselves are targets of assault weapons. That is how the two police officers in Bristol were killed with an AR-15 type weapon. And we can do more with common sense gun safety to make our police and Senator, our community safer. Senator, thank you. Mrs. Levy, you have one minute. Yes, well, I'm very proud that I was endorsed by the state fraternal order of police because they know that I will always have their backs. And it's interesting to hear my opponent talk about another election year uh, policy that he suddenly embraced because actually in 2020 he attended a defund the police rally and called for reimagining the police. I'm not sure what that means to him, but that certainly doesn't sound like he supports the police to me. And I was, I was at the funeral for our two cops in Bristol. It was gut-wrenching, frankly, to watch their young wives and to listen to the eulogies. And, you know, my opponent supported the passing here in the state of the police accountability law that created a shortage of police because they defunded the police, removed their qualified immunity, and re created revolving door justice. There's a Mrs. general Levy, climate, anti much. an anti-police climate now, thank you for and your, my opponent we do have another supported question that. For you coming up next, Let me actually. just correct the record, if well, I, I may. I have never, sure, ever supported defunding the police. That's just you plain didn't wrong. speak out about it. You were there. I actually have spoken out you about it as a number, at a number of them. those rallies, specifically saying we should not defund the police. I've done it on the floor of the Senate. I've done it in the Constitutional Subcommittee. To say that I have favored defunding the police is unfortunately in June of just 2020. You were in Hartford at All that right. defund the police Thank rally. Thank you both very much, Mrs. Levy. We are going to have another question for you right now, and Great. this is from my colleague Susan Raff. And it is about the former president. Mrs. Levy, you've been endorsed by Donald Trump. And when we spoke recently, you had mentioned that you traveled to his home in Florida for a fundraiser. And he's helped you raise money for your campaign against Senator Blumenthal. And my question is, why do you align yourself with Donald Trump in a state like Connecticut when most voters don't support the former president. A Quinnipiac poll found about 62 percent had an unfavorable rating of him. At a 2016 primary, you uh, felt differently about Donald Trump. You supported him. And in 2012, your position on reproductive rights was a bit different as well. You were pro-choice. I would like you to comment on that. And conversely, I would like to ask Senator Blumenthal if you feel President Biden is the right leader and choice for Democrats, especially when some of those same polls find that people don't have a lot of faith in the president and approve of the job that he's doing. Mrs. Levy, you have two minutes. So is the question for me or for my it's, opponent? It's for you, two minutes. Okay, I'd like the time back. I had to clarify because it's... Absolutely, we'll Thank take care of that right much. now for sure. So, you know, I'm a uniter. I've been endorsed by a lot of people in our party, uh, from the former president to Nikki Haley to Rob Portman to, you know, uh, Rick Grinnell. I have a lot of endorsements, and uh, I'm, I'm proud of that because I am a uniter. I'm Leora Levy. I am on the ballot. And I am running against someone who had over $8 million in his uh, campaign funds. I had to raise a lot of money, and um, it was very helpful to me. I was very happy to, to take the endorsements from many people in my party. I just wonder if, if my opponent endorses the only candidate person who has said he will be a candidate, and that is President Biden, because he has said he's running. There's nobody else running right now in either party except President Biden. So 
It's really his name that's on the ballot this year as well because he is responsible for every single policy that is making life easier difficult for Connecticut families, whether it's the invasion at the border that's bringing fentanyl into our state. You know, eight babies have died in Connecticut from fentanyl poisoning. Teenagers have died. Young Americans have died. I was with the mother of a, of a 29 year old who thought he was taking something else and was poisoned by fentanyl. That open border, which my opponent has never condemned, has supported. He knows they've been flying illegals to Westchester County Airport since August of 2021. He has never spoken out against it. And they're bringing human trafficking. What's going on at that border is not, not compassionate. It is cruel. Children are being kidnapped from their villages. They are indentured for the rest of their lives Mrs. to pay Levy, back the cartels. You. Thank this you very much. This is a terrible that, situation. That is your two minutes right there. Susan actually asked two questions in one there. So, Senator Blumenthal, we want to give you two minutes to respond to her question. Before about we move on, can you clarify what made you change your opinion about President Trump and your stance on reproductive rights? So... My stance on reproductive rights, I, I changed my opinion. My heart changed. I, I, as science improved and we learned more about the development of the babies in the womb, and then when I considered my personal experience having children, I realized that I could, and, I, and the more I learned about the abortion industry, by the way, my opponent has written the most extreme abortion law that, that there is, allowing abortion up to the moment of birth, and I believe that that's not where the American people are. Most Americans w feel that that is infanticide. The only Mrs. countries Levy, that allow you. that are China and North Korea. I just North want to Korea. say for the record, you had about, you had exactly two minutes and 30 seconds there. So, Senator, we're okay. going to give you two minutes and 30 seconds right now. Thank you. I think there are at least three questions that have been asked, and let me try to deal with them one by one. First of all, former President Trump isn't on the ballot, but his main supporter in Connecticut is. My opponent has said to President Trump, I will always have your back. If you always have President Trump's back, you can't have Connecticut's back. Well, if you are 100% for Trump, that's 100% wrong for Connecticut. It's not only that Donald Trump has endorsed her, but she is a supporter of former President Trump. Now, as to Biden, he is not yet running. He's made no, no decision. If he decides to run, I would probably support him, but we don't know who else is going to run. And let me deal with this issue of abortion. I've heard those reassurances, respect for state law. I heard them from three Supreme Court justice nominees who then ripped up Roe v. Wade enabling a national ban on abortion. If my opponent is elected, she is, by her own statement, a reliable 51st vote for Mitch McConnell, who will lead a national ban on abortion, as he has said he would, who will stack our courts with anti-choice justices. She has said she celebrates the overturning of Roe v. Wade. I am the only person on this platform who will fight to restore a woman's right to make personal health care decisions affecting her body. I trust women to make that decision. I believe it is one of the central issues of our time. And we must enact protections, not only in the states, but at the national level. As for this deception, I hesitate to call it but it is deception that somehow the Women's Health Protection Act, which I proudly wrote, is somehow extreme. In fact, it incorporates simply the standard of Roe v. Wade, which allows for restrictions later in pregnancy, taking into account the health and Senator, safety of the mother. Senator, thank you very much. That was a combined five minutes, and I appreciate both of you uh, for your time right there. We do want to ask you one final question, and we're going to put one minute on the clock for each of you. If you will accept, and Mrs. Levy, I'll start with you, if you will accept the outcome of the election here in Connecticut. Of course. 
I'd love to talk more, though, about the last question as well and some of the things he said. Well, we'd you like know, to, we want to stay focused on that because you will have time coming up for, for your formal closing statement. Senator, what is your response to accepting the results of the election? Yes, without question. Okay. Thank you both very much. Well, at this point, we do want to give you both two minutes for your closing statement. And I believe, if I remember correctly, uh, Senator Blumenthal, you are going to start us off with that uh, right now, sir. Thank you. Uh, again, my thanks to everyone who is joining us. Uh, all too often, powerful special interests have their way. My job has always been to stand up to them and fight for the people of Connecticut. And that's why we will have lower pharmaceutical drugs because we put a cap on the amount that seniors have to pay. I want to extend it to all people. I pushed for release of Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Prices went down. I think we need to do more like a windfall profits rebate. We need to encourage more drilling in the short term, but in the long term, rely on renewables. And that's why I've supported those measures that will put pressure on the oil companies to provide more supply and on Saudi Arabia. Cut arms to Saudi Arabia if they continue to cut supplies. We can bring down the cost of gasoline and other essential commodities. There are 3.5 million veterans right now who have protection, care and benefits against the toxic effects of the burn pits and other sources. There are 500,000 people who had tax cuts until the Republicans refused to renew the child tax credit. There are millions of seniors who have the benefit of those pharmaceutical drugs. I'm going to be fighting for the people of Connecticut. My opponent has told Donald Trump that she will always have his back. I will be standing for the people of Connecticut, fighting for them, siding with them, first, last, and always. Senator, thank you very much. Mrs. Levy, you have the final two minutes tonight. Well, we have heard two very vision, very different visions of Connecticut and of America because my opponent seems to be obsessed with the past. I am concerned about the future. I'm concerned about your children, the kind of education they're receiving. I'm concerned about the fentanyl coming over that open border. I'm concerned about the crime in our communities. Nobody feels safe anymore. I'm concerned that nobody can afford to feed their, their lives anymore. It's hard to make, you have to make decisions. Do I feed my children? Do I fill my car? Am I going to be able to get home heating oil? And if I can, will I afford it? All of these problems were created by the failed policies of the Biden administration, voted for and rubber stamped by my 37 year career politician opponent. He reacts to things the way a politician does and he just imposes that on me thinking that I'm like he is but I'm not I'm a, I call myself a career American yo soy cubana americana escape el comunismo en cuba yo amo este país i love this country i came here from cuba escaping communism my mother and her parents escaped the nazis my father says, if this country goes, where do we go next? That is why I'm running for U.S. Senate. I'm going to fight for Connecticut, fight for your children and their future, fight for our country. And my opponent, on the other hand, I escaped communism. He attends the Communist Party and then says he doesn't. He said he fought in Vietnam, but he didn't. He attends meetings with CARE, the... Um, that is an, uh, an unindicted co-conspirator in a terrorist Levy, thank trial. You. Thank and, you very and much. And he says he's fighting for you. We appreciate your time, both of you. We cannot thank you both enough for being here tonight for this one-on-one uh, -on -one debate, the only one happening here in the state. It's obviously a very important vote, and we, again, appreciate you being here. That concludes our debate tonight, and we, of course, thank the candidates and all of you for joining us here on Eyewitness News. We do want to thank our partners as well at CT Insider and all of our panelists here and their great questions. Election Day is next Tuesday, and that is when it's up to you. Make sure you get out there and vote. We will see you tonight for Eyewitness News at 11. Have a great night, everybody. Everybody.